The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Today's broadcast is one about science, and it's interesting to see what people so often get wrong when it comes to science. Like science is some object that operates like even a religious totem for scientists. Or the word theory gets tossed around like scientists are just guessing. There's a whole chapter at a series called Understanding the Misconceptions of Science at the Great Courses Plus. Do a whole chapter on evolution, which is what we're talking about today. You know, the man from Monkey's argument, abiogenesis, the claim that evolution operates with some kind of a goal, some kind of an end zone in mind. This is a great course and so relevant, primo information that ties into today's discussion. But of course, you can go so much deeper at The Great Courses Plus, an educational streaming service that makes learning easy and accessible with thousands of lectures on so many topics. Now is a great time to try them out. My listeners can get a free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. You can check out everything from the fundamentals of photography to cooking basics to law school for everyone and all that's in between. Sign up now through my special URL to start your free trial. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. Remember, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. It is almost the year 2020, and here I am as an activist. I'm sure you feel the same. You're still having some conversations with religious people about why they don't accept the fact of evolution often because they are embracing even a young Earth creationist model. The Earth was created in six literal days, or maybe they weren't actual literal days, maybe those days were God's days, which could be millions of years. But regardless, they reject evolution, and they believe that we are designed, we are created, and that all of life all around us is sort of a product of that. And it's still going on. I still have a great many people who... They are ignorant of the basic facts of evolution. Hell, I was the same way for decades of my life. And I was embarrassed by how much I had gotten wrong because I'd been taught wrong things when I was a believer. And so Dr. Donald Prothero was instrumental for me when I was coming out of the faith. His work, his speeches, his books help to educate me and give me a civilian, you know, somebody who doesn't have a PhD, give me some of the basic information that I needed to be able to accept the fact of evolution. And that's what this broadcast is. We're not going to reinvent the wheel, but because we're still having these conversations out there, I thought it might be helpful. He's always a wealth of information, and it's certainly something I hope that you benefit from as well. Dr. Donald Prothero, you have authored how many books now? Uh, next year, it'll be the 44th will come out. I have four coming out next year. What is that a year? <laughs> How long have you been doing this? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't have any this year because I was working on four different books simultaneously. And the way publishing works is always uh, more delays than you think there will be. So they'll bunch up next year as if I wrote them all one year. You are a geologist, a paleontologist. Uh, what else do I put? I mean, when I'm describing you, I mean, you have so many credits, I'm trying to pare it down. Like, how do you introduce yourself at parties kind of thing? Uh, <laughs> well, most parties, people are not that interested in this anyway. But uh, no, I would say paleontologist first and foremost, but my, uh, my uh, PhD is in geological sciences. And most of what I teach is geology most of the time. But, you know, I do a little bit of planetary science. I have to teach oceanography and meteorology. So I find myself doing a really wide spectrum of things, plus evolutionary biology, because I have a background in biology as well. You also do some debunking. I know you've got uh, work that talks about some of the scam artists out there, some of the bad science pseudo 
pseudoscience, and you've tackled that, right? Yeah, uh, over the years, I've, I've been a member of the Skeptic Society since it was founded, and over the years, I find myself writing about a lot of those topics. So I have a book out with a colleague of mine on UFOs and aliens, and I have a separate book with a different colleague out on Bigfoot and other uh, cryptids, and I wrote a book back in 2011 about uh, science denialism and how it might affect our future. We are in the science denialism era, it seems. I mean, in the past, yeah, we're ruled it was, by a party of science nihilists. Yeah, I mean, it used to be ignorance was the problem. Now it's just straight up denial. Do you watch right. the news? Do you have an opinion on what's happening? Well, I try not to watch the news. It's too upsetting. But uh, you know, it pops into my Facebook feed and every place else, so it's hard not to know what's happening. And I do read the newspaper, which is a little more cool and objective and easier to follow. And you know, it's 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 tragic because. When I started my career, scientists tried as much as possible to be neutral, to be non-political. It was not considered good form for scientists to enter into political discussions when we're talking about a scientific topic. And most of us followed that. And then this last 10, 15 years especially, and especially in the last three and a half years, one political party only has become the party of science deniers. And so they've embraced creationism, and of course they embrace climate denial, and the largest percentage of anti-vaxxers are also right-wingers too. And so we have a whole political party now, which has got our country in a terrible course of science denial, and the consequences are going to be felt for our generations to come. So you're a professor. Let's say this is a classroom, right? This is Evolution 101. Your room is filled with students, some of whom have to be religious, some of whom might be young earth creationists. You as the instructor, how do you start that conversation? How do you introduce evolution to your students? Uh, If I have to introduce it in such a way that I expect the audience might be a little bit on the other side, I try to be really clear up front about the rules of science and the nature of science, and that's something I often introduce in many of my classes, is a little mini lecture for 20 minutes, 30 minutes about the nature of science and what science does and doesn't do. And one of the first things you have to say is, of course, science is about naturalism. It's about what we can observe in nature and follows natural laws and supernatural things are not necessarily wrong or right, but they can't be part of science because you can't test them. There's no way to test a supernatural hypothesis like Zeus did it or God did it, right? That's the usual cop-out that religious people use when they can't explain something, but it's not acceptable in science to do that. You have to have a, a testable hypothesis that can be shot down. And I say those rules up really clear, up really front, and then I, you know, I say basically this is about evidence. It's not about a particular religious belief one way or another. It's about what does the evidence show. And this is the only thing scientists are beholden to is evidence. They are not supposed to take the prior belief systems in place, although there are exceptions to that. They're supposed to follow the evidence where it lies. And uh, that's something that a lot of people just haven't been exposed to. I mean, especially kids that come out of high school, what they get in science classes is really this watered-down, you know, sort of you know, cartoon version of science. You know, with, and they test their hypotheses, you know, and then they confirm their experiment. And actually, it's much more complicated than that in the real world. And the other thing I'd point out to them is science, unlike any other field of human endeavor, is self-correcting. It's the only one thing that has fact checks anymore. I mean, uh, media no longer are trustworthy, and so many of them are so biased with no fact-checking at all. And, uh, and sadly, of course, the Internet is a giant cesspool of lies with all sorts of crap on there that isn't real. And uh, lots of people don't realize this yet. And science, unlike anything else we still do, has fact-checking in the form of peer review. Everything published in a scientific journal is supposed to be checked anonymously by your worst enemy, usually. Uh, and you have to give them their, people, your critics, a chance to shoot you down. And you're supposed to actually reply to that and defend it if you can. If you can't, your paper isn't even published. And nothing else has that degree of stringent fact-checking anymore left in our society. Everything else is just what everyone wants to say. And unfortunately, people buy whatever they want to believe, not what has been checked. So I'm Susie Q. Homeschooler in your class. I got my hand in the air. I've got to do a few basic questions that some of our veterans will have heard a hundred times. But bear with me. I want to do due diligence here. If we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? How do you respond? Yeah, that is based on misconception about how evolution works. Evolution is not about slowly evolving from from mud to apes to humans in a continuous line. 
Uh, it's not a climbing up. The, the, the ancient uh, idea about it was to climb the ladder of life or the great chain of being and to climb from more primitive animals up to humans and then higher. That has been entirely debunked. It's not part of modern biology and hasn't been since 1859. The way people now think about evolution, it's a branching pattern. Uh, ancestors and descendants are coexisting. A descendant branched from an ancestor, and the ancestors are still around. And that's the way most evolution now works. We understand this from a lot of evidence, not only just by watching evolution happen now, but also from the fossil record. This is what shows up in the fossil record, too. And so a good analogy to get this point across is, you know, when uh, instead of you know, monkeys turning into humans, it's your branching point off of the great apes. Uh, you had a common ancestor with them about 7 million years ago, based on both the fossil record and molecular evidence, which both point to that date. And it's analogous to saying, you know, it's like a branching tree of your own family, right? Your father didn't die the moment you were born. Right, you overlap with most cases with your father, uh, and you probably overlap with your grandfather. He didn't die when your father was born, let alone when you were born, because you branch off both from your father and your grandfather. And so this is the way you have to think. You have to think like trees, like a family tree, not think about this idea of marching up a ladder of life. It's interesting. They always show that evolution graphic. It shows like the single-celled organism coming right. out of the goop, right. and then it's like all of a sudden they're primates and a human at the end of it. It's this linear thing. It's, it's, it's iconic. Yeah, it's the most famous. You all have to do is show something like that. That is what immediately people think of, and they say, "See evolution." Uh, in fact, it's completely wrong. It hasn't been a valid way to think about evolution since Darwin's time. Let's talk about the 747 and a tornado argument. The only reason I bring it up is because some of the old school hardcore apologists still bring it up, and it's the complexity yep. argument. If you can explain the tornado and 747 in a junkyard argument for everybody and then why it is incorrect. The argument actually goes back to not a creationist, but to a famous astronomer named Fred Hoyle, who was also sort of an iconoclast. And he was arguing that uh, the odds of assembling the complexity of molecular biology by uh, by random chance is the same as the odds of, say, assembling uh, a complicated item like a bow in 747 out of a, a tornado in a junkyard, something along those lines. And that, of course, is picked up by Dwayne Gish for many years in his debates, and a lot of creationists use it still. And it's a completely false analogy because it takes a completely false idea about evolution. This is almost always the case. These arguments are made against evolution. They're shooting at the wrong target. They're shooting at a straw man that doesn't represent evolution at all. And the, this particular case, what's going on in this argument, is they say, well, evolution can't be uh, uh, cause us because there's random chance won't produce something uh, ordered. But evolution is not random, Okay. Natural selection is a very highly directed and very, very uh, you know, fine-tuned mechanism, and it's completely non-random. Natural selection selects among things that were chosen by random by genetic variation. So the only part that's random in this system is that what you get in the way of a product is, gener is generated by genetic mutations and things like that. But then natural selection sorts it, and only the best variants will survive. And the analogy is, is another analogy which is commonly used to get tack evolution saying, and what are the odds that a monkey with a typewriter can uh, type out the works of Shakespeare or even just one line from Shakespeare? Of course, you calculate that, it seems uh, ridiculous. But again, the analogy is completely wrong. It's not what evolution's about. And a better way to put that together is to say, what about a monkey with a word processor that has a spell check? And you know this if you've ever typed in any of the word processing softwares that have spell checks. You type in a word that it recognizes, it will fix it for you. And the same way the natural selection works. It will, it will get rid of any bad things by either fixing them or dumping them and looking for a variant that does work. And so it's highly selective. It has a way of editing out bad uh, stuff and that's generated by random mutation and ends up producing things that are very, very fine-tuned. So this is entirely based on this misconception about how evolution is. It's not random. All right? Natural selection is very directed. Okay? Only the source of variation is random. Does this get us into the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law, right? Because right. according to them, according to their misrepresentation of the second law, things can only become more disordered over time. There can right. be no organized or complex life that sort of, uh, they always say randomly. You want to get into the second right. law for us? Yes. Uh, once again, they completely misunderstand what they're talking about. They've, every one of their talking points has been debunked 50, 70 years ago, in <laughs> fact. And they don't ever learn. They just keep repeating the same false stuff because they don't understand it and they don't want to learn. Uh, in a nutshell, what this is about, um, 
The second law of thermodynamics, if you look it up in any actual source, like a physics textbook or even on Wikipedia, okay, they will always say that nature does not go to, you know, nature does not go from uh, un- disordered to ordered. It usually goes from disorder to disorder. Things decay. Things fall apart. It's called entropy in physics. And uh, the, But the proviso is in a closed system. And if you ever look up the actual definition of second law of thermodynamics in a source other than creationists, you'll find it always says in a closed system. So you have a closed box with gas at a certain temperature, okay, and you keep it closed and don't add any heat or anything to the inside of the box, eventually those molecules will slow down and become less ordered, okay? That's, that's entropy. That's loss of energy, okay? That is the only place that applies. But the Earth and solar system are not closed, Okay, they have a source of energy, which is the sun, the nuclear decay reactions that make the sun work, and that energy gets to the earth, and that powers things. So the earth is not closed. The earth is constantly getting additional energy from outside, and then it converts the energy into many different forms, among which is life, which converts the energy of the sun into photosynthesis and, and into uh, biochemicals, and then from there we build. And so again, it's the same problem as before. They're attacking a straw man. They're attacking something that's completely misunderstood, and it should have been understood a long time ago, but it shows how creationists won't listen to any outside evidence and won't correct themselves when they're wrong. And like the, all the previous arguments, this is something a scientist is never allowed to do. If I've misstated something or if I've made a mistake and I've uh, made a, had to correct it, I'm not allowed to go back and say the same mistake over again. You know, I'm not allowed to keep repeating something that's been debunked. I lose my reputation as a scientist by doing that, okay? But a creationist don't care. They're not scientists. They're only just doing propaganda and PR, and they just keep on repeating garbage that's been debunked decades ago because they don't care to understand why it's wrong. Talking here with Dr. Donald Prothero, can we get into Darwinian evolution? Is it true that it's the fittest that always survive? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is that's an oversimplification of what's going on, and there's a lot of misunderstanding of the terminology there. Uh, I mean, Darwin himself used various other terms, and survival of the fittest wasn't exactly his term either. It actually came from Herbert Spencer. Uh, but the basic idea is that there's, you know, among any population, there are certain organisms that are better adapted to a particular set of circumstances than others, and those will be the ones that survive and reproduce. But that changes all the time. It's a dynamic system. And so what's fit at one time may not be fit at the next time. And there's no ultimate fitness that will always survive every time. And so people get the idea that it's some kind of supernatural power or, or the idea of fit, being fit means you're, you know, you're perfect in every regard and you can out-survive anything else. They especially apply that to humans, thinking humans are the most fit of all because we rule the planet. Uh, but that is not what Darwin intended, and no one in the biology community still uses those definitions. Something that's fit at one time may not be fit some at other time. Something that's fit in one environment may not be fit in another. So a woolly mammoth was a very fit individual in its time, as long as it was living on the edge of the glaciers, okay? But it was not fit anywhere else in the ice ages where glaciers weren't, and it's not fit today because there aren't those large glaciers that used to be there. So what's fit changes from time to time. Is there a difference between creationism and intelligent design? Yes. Um, Yeah, I mean, officially, intelligent design, when it was created in the 1990s and early 2000s, was an attempt to dodge the the fact that creationism was always a religious dogma. And as as a religious dogma, every time it came to being put into public schools, the courts would would point out it was a religious dogma and it's a violation of the First Amendment Establishment Clause. So that was when they, they, you know, they, first they tried to have what they called scientific creationism, where they took standard creationist books and just took out the word God and everything else was the same. And when that failed in the courts in the early 90s, that's when they ta- adapted the strategy of intelligent design, where they rewrote the books a little bit more cleverly, so there was an obvious reference to a deity in there, but everything was still the same arguments borrowed from the old creationist books. There wasn't any real difference there at all. And, of course, if you look into the statements of people who were then the pioneers of intelligent design made, people like Behe and the rest, they clearly say in other occasions that the whole thing is basically a political ruse. It's an attempt to get around the Establishment Clause by pretending they're not committed to any particular version of creationism or religion, except that all the men who pushed it back in the 90s and the early 2000s clearly said in other contexts, yes, that's what it is. It's for our Christianity that we're doing it, to get, a, get creationism back into the public eye. 
And that was, of course, understood, and the courts uh, ruled against them in 2005 in the Dover decision. That was one of the major things that clearly established that there was no question. It was a religious dogma that was disguised, and it had no bearing in, uh, no, no place in public schools. And the good news is that intelligent design, for all intents and purposes, is just about dead. Um, yes, there's a site that still maintains it up there at Discovery Institute in Seattle. But if you look at various Google searches that are done of topics of, you know, whether they're hot in the media, it just about died after 2005, 2006. Because once it was killed in the courts, the creationists were changed again. They went to other strategies to try to force creationists into public schools and dilute evolution, and they stopped using intelligent design. So I consider it a passe issue. It's now been almost 14 years since the courts ruled it was religion, and so they're really not even relevant to the modern discussion anymore. I mean, I'm seeing like the William Lane Craigs. I mean, the old school, the people we've been talking about for way too long. Um, many of them, I think, in a quest for relevance <laughs> in the year 2019. But, uh, you know, is creationism still, I mean, they're still teaching it in religious schools, religious homeschools, in Christian churches. Yeah. So it's, it's not, it's still a thing in specific circles, just not by rule of law. What's happened is that it is, it's always this case. The creationists, every time they're beaten in the courts, they find a, a more subtle way to push their dogma and push their ideas without uh, you know, being caught by the things that they got stuck on previously. So first they tried scientific creationism after courts ruled creationism itself was religion. Then they put the God references out and claimed they were scientific, and that got ruled down, shot down by courts. And then they tell the design it was a little more subtle. Uh, but as I said before, it was clearly pushed by Protestant religious uh, dogmatists, and they would never, even though they said to the public, we were not claiming any particular deity is in charge of this. In fact, they were very clearly trying to push their version of deities, and that's why they lost. So after 2005, the strategy has been mostly to do a sort of a, uh, a passive aggressive type of counter defense, which is doing everything to, to damage the teaching of evolution in public schools and make it hard to do. And, uh, there are various strategies they've employed, mostly like teach the differences, you know, strengths and weakness of each argument. So they'll try to do something where they get the biology teachers forced to, to uh, take the creationist talking points about critiques of evolution. And they don't want to just add creationism into that flavor, but that gives students doubts about evolution and creates the, the opportunity they need. Um, and, you know, so this both sides of the argument type thing. But we don't teach both sides of, you know, Copernican astronomy and Ptolemaic astronomy. Or nobody actually thinks that the sun is uh, not the center of the solar system anymore. And we don't teach false ideas from science that have been debunked 400 years ago. There's no reason we should be uh, teaching both sides of the argument in evolution, which is more than 150 years have been established. Um, and so that's one strategy. And there's others as well, you know, giving teachers uh, these uh, sort of things where they're not allowed to be told what to teach, as if teachers are, you know, capable of doing all this stuff without any guidance from ex experts at all. There's a, they're just a sort of delaying strategies and, and diluting strategies to make evolution either harder to teach or just discourage it being taught at all. And putting in little things will allow teachers to do their own creationist thing without saying so in so many words, because they can't win in courts any other way. It's interesting. When you were talking, I was thinking about that film, The Merchants of Doubt, where they're talking about how, you know, it's mm -hmm. enough to go in. You don't have to debunk it outright. Just go sow enough seeds of doubt and then just say, right. discuss, right? Well, here's the uh, scientific answer and here's the magical answer. Uh, let's talk about this, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. As I said, I mean, nobody's... Nobody's debating, well, there are some crazies who think they're the slap, but let's not take them seriously for the moment and saying nobody in public schools would argue you should have equal time to flat earthers and to uh, round earthers. Uh, that seems absurd to most of us, right? And that same goes with evolution. No one's giving uh, an idea that's uh, from the Bronze Age shepherds who didn't know anything about the world equal time with modern science, right? It's just as crazy as that. Or astrology and astronomy, they're not the same thing. Unfortunately, the public doesn't know the difference, but they are definitely one science and one's bullshit. So, you know, this is the problem. You know, the public is already very confused about what science is and isn't, and they're full of ideas which are clearly false. And, uh, of course, we have media now which don't make an effort to discriminate those things or to debunk any of them. They just play whatever public wants to hear. So we get a lot of garbage. People have been by the environment, and also they've just picked up from various sources. Dr. Prothero, you brought him up. This is maybe more of a philosophical question. How does flat Earth happen in the year 2019? How do we get here? 
That is bizarre. I've, I've got a new book that will be out next year about those topics, the flat earthers, the, the geocentrists, you know, the expanding earthers, all the crackpot ideas about the earth, which uh, you know, you think would be completely dis- extinct in the 21st century, but actually they've had a revival. And it mostly comes from, well, there's always a certain element of creationism behind that. A lot of creationists are flat earthers, because if you do read the Bible literally, there are multiple passages that have uh, flat earth uh, uh, descriptions in them, and it only makes sense if they're described as flat earth, which, of course, in the time of the ancient Hebrews, when these texts were first written, that's what they thought. Um, but the modern flat earthers are mostly people, if they're not just religious fundamentalists, they're, you know, they're often these sort of people who get famous for not any particular good reason. Like, celebrities are famous for being famous, you know, like these, uh, you know, uh, whatever her name is. They, they're, they're not even, they have never accomplished anything. There's no reason the media should give them attention, but they get that attention. And they, uh, they uh, Tia Tequila is the name I was trying to grasp. I have no idea if she's done anything worth noting, but she's famous. Uh, and uh, then, then the other line of people who get from the public niche and being flat earthers are jocks, athletes, especially famous uh Basketball players seem to be the biggest percentage of them. And why would anything consider an NBA player to be an intellectual? I don't know, because most of them never go for four years of college to begin with if they go to class at all. So this is strange. You know, the media give attention to people who have no brains and no interest in uh, what's real, and they don't listen to people who actually know what they're talking about. Uh, so we have this funky thing where that, those are the ones who get it in the public eye, and then it's picked up by a variety of people who've been sort of in the background all the time. I believe in flat earth. And it's, the flat eartherism is really goes back to something very fundamental, which is people tend to believe what they intuitively see and feel over what evidence tells them. And there's a lot of things in science which are not easy to understand because they don't jive with your short-term thinking or your immediate vicinity. They're, you know, if you just think about what you see when you spend all your time on the ground, the world looks flat. Okay, and you have to be in a very, very high aircraft to see the curvature of the Earth, uh, and so it, it, it does take a while to get your setting away from the intuitive, sort of naturalistic way to see the world, and to recognize that there is evidence that's uh, telling you this is not true, but. It's a, it takes some work to get to it. Uh, and the same goes for some of the other things that flat earthers just don't grasp. You know, they don't like the idea of the curvature. Uh, they, they just, it's just, just counterintuitive, therefore must be wrong. You know, what I feel, what I see is correct. What other people tell me based on evidence is not. And this is really sad because what it's showing is that people no longer trusting people who actually do have expertise. It's a death of, you know, trust in the experts and trust in people who really should be taken seriously because they're the ones they know what they're talking about. So, uh, you know, we're seeing this decay happen. It's the media get full of lies all the time. People don't know what to trust. And they've been told crap about science for a long time, so they don't trust science. And now they just go going on instinct, which is not a good way to go. I had a question on the chat from Philip. He said, why is the phrasing in documentaries always misleading? For example, Animal XYZ developed long arms so it can reach this and that. Yeah. It's always yeah. implying a purpose, although it should say the development that allowed the species to survive. You right. want to speak to that right. distinction? Yeah, that is a big problem. I've worked a, you know, a couple of times as a consultant on documentaries, and they they trying to be scientific when they can, but they're also not scientists themselves, the ones who write these scripts. And they tend to write to things that are fairly simplistic and especially often very anthropomorphic so that the listener and the viewer can really relate to the topic. And so they don't realize that in some cases they don't even know any better that they're making mistakes when they say this kind of thing. You know, this is what's called teleology in science. Uh, organisms are not striving to be better or to reach some ultimate goal. They're just trying to survive. And they did the short-term adaptation of any kind is all they need. And they're not trying to make themselves into a perfect organism because nothing is. Uh, but a writer in a science show often doesn't know that. Uh, or they're doing something like they're doing a shorthand, right? They're trying to say something straightforward, but they know that the complicated argument behind it will be completely confusing. So, uh, for example, in the case of radiometric dating, the only rocks you can date it radiometrically are those that were once molten lava. Uh, so volcanic ashes, lava flows, that kind of thing are the only rocks that actually are datable. But they'll say, well, this sandstone was dated at 400 million years. And I, actually, this is a question I pose in my exam to my students. There's two possibilities. One, that the person is lying to you and trying to deceive you, which we can pretty much rule out if it's NOVA. 
But the other is that they're trying to say something simple without giving you all the, the background that's behind it. So when we say a sandstone is 40 million years ago, what we really mean is that it has a distinctive group of fossils that tell us that age, let's say Devonian, which is 400 million years ago, and then someplace else on the sur- surface of the Earth, there are volcanic ashes or lava flows that surround fossils like it, and those have been radiometrically dated at 400 million years. But in a documentary, you don't have time to explain all the why we know something. And so they just jump right to the conclusion without giving you the correct background. And this is just an inherent problem. It's a problem of trying to make the stuff lively and also to make it short and clear without uh, explaining, explaining the background, which means often it misleads you a bit on what's really known. Yeah, how do you explain complex science on Twitter in 280 characters? You can't. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. yeah. You're, 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 the, I mean, there's something I've always challenged, it always challenges me. And when I'm in a uh, class, for example, I say, okay, you're in college now. We don't do multiple choice tests here. You've got to understand the principles. And in particular, I want you to understand why, as many times as I get to introduce this, I don't always have that chance, but why scientists say something here. What, on what evidence do scientists say that so-and-so is so-and-so? If I can introduce that and not run out of time, I do that because I think that's really valuable to any college-level student to have that fundamental understanding of the evidence behind or the methods we use to make a certain statement so that they aren't misled like so much of the American public is when they're talking about something and they don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, it's hard to do because, you know, it requires bigger investment in time and a bigger investment in brain power to really get into it and understand it and understand the reasons behind it and the evidence. But, you know, that's something I'm very much a believer in, the minute historical geology book it's got a big push for that all the way through it where I have little side things that give you the evidence and explain why something is a certain way and the book I have another book coming out next year one of the four is a book I wrote as I mentioned a moment ago about flat earthers and geocentrists and hollow earthers and expanding earthers and all the other things it's called weird earth you know all the crackpot ideas about the earth and one of the things I try really hard to do in most of the chapters where I can is to list a bunch of ev- lines of evidence and how we can interpret them that has allowed us to have this scientific viewpoint so this reader can judge for themselves why do we know this is not scientists say therefore you must accept it scientists have found this that is why they accept it you should probably accept it too short break when i come back we're going to go to the switchboard talk to our listeners also i've got a question about dinosaurs More with Dr. Donald Prothero on the other side of this. Hang on. Let me tell you about one of the ultimate life hacks. Because it's hard to find free time to read and learn more. But knowledge should be something that we're always pursuing. And there's an incredible app that solves the free time problem. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is something unique. It works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser. It takes the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from thousands of non-fiction books, and condenses them down to about 15 minutes, whether you're reading or listening to the audiobook. Blinkist is made for people with busy schedules who still want to evolve their own knowledge base. In fact, 8 million people are using Blinkist right now, and I am one of them. I like to listen to Blinkist audiobooks when I'm out running errands in the car or in my headset when I'm out walking Linus. I just finished, and I want to recommend Hector McDonald's book. It's called Truth, How the Many Sides to Every Story Shape Our Reality. That is so relevant in a time when we get sound bites, but not always the big picture, right? Blinkist also has books like the bestseller from Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, pared down to a lean 19 minutes on Blinkist. Blinkist. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for this audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Seth. Try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free seven-day trial. And you'll also save 25% off, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash Seth. Talking here with Dr. Donald Prothero. 
He is a paleontologist, a geologist, author, and educator. We've been talking a lot about evolution, what the fossils say. We're going to get into dinosaurs. Just a fascinating conversation and a helpful one, I hope, as we engage creationists out there in our conversations, trying to promote science and reason and data and evidence while they're promoting dogma and faith and magical books filled with, you know, a dirt man and a rib woman in a garden with talking animals. It's just so frustrating. Anyway, let's go to the switchboard, see what our listeners have to say. Area code 801 on the switchboard. Thanks for calling in. You were on the air with Dr. Donald Prothero. Who's this? Hey, Seth. It's Amanda from Facebook. Amanda, thanks for calling in. What do you have for the show today? Comment or question? Uh, Yeah, question. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the distinction of I run into this a lot, um, and whether there even is a distinction of microevolution and macroevolution. I run into that all the time, and I don't see it as a useful concept, but I wondered if it it even is a concept that's worth giving time to. Okay, yes, uh, that is a tricky one to deal with because um, there are are different schools of thought within evolutionary biology about how we should treat the changes that are really small that you can see practically in a, in a short period of time, like a changes in the number of veins in a fruit fly wing or uh, changes in a mouse, things we can do in a laboratory in a really short period of time. And then the bigger changes, of course, which have been called macroevolution, things that lead to, you know, the new innovation like uh, flight and birds, something like that is often treated as being something of a larger order. And a high percentage, maybe a majority of evolutionary biologists would say they're the same thing, that macroevolution is just you know, tiny mutations that build up and build up and build up until you get to a bigger scale thing. Uh, but my, my mentor, Stephen Jay Gould, I was, uh, I was trained by Niles Eldridge, but I know Steve was a good friend of mine when he was active, uh, and now gone, of course, was always one of these people who argued that in paleontology we see evidence for things that, uh, that take fairly large genetic jumps to happen, but we also now know, thanks to evolution development, or Evo Devo it's called, that you can do these things where you can switch an organism from one stage to another just by tampering with its development, and they'll develop a whole new organ in a, in a fairly short period of time. So that is macro. That is different from just fruit fly wings or things like that. But it's also not that different in the sense that it's not really uh, something we can't explain by science. It's something that science is showing us operates on a slightly different level than the stuff that people who play with fruit flies for a century have always done. Now, the creations exploit that because they know they cannot deny microevolution because it's been seen and witnessed all the time, and they themselves can concede that. So they say, therefore, you know, microevolution isn't evolution. Only macroevolution is. Well, That's because it's very hard to watch macroevolution happen in real time because it is a big process that has taken place mostly in large-scale things in the past. But there have been some remarkable experiments that have done recently where we see what you might call macroevolutionary changes. Uh, We know, for example, that if you uh, tamper with the genomes of uh, uh, birds, you can get them to develop dinosaur teeth again. Uh, if you tamper with the genomes of birds, you can get them to develop a, a dinosaur snout with teeth rather than a beak. If you tamper with the genomes of birds, you can get them to develop a bony tail like a dinosaur. In other words, these things happen pretty easily if you just have a large genetic change, and they aren't that big a deal to happen, and that would be considered macro by most people in biology. So it's not supernatural. It's not something beyond our explanation. But unfortunately, that's something creations exploit really well. Amanda, did you find it was not useful because it's, what, just academic? Or can you explain why you didn't find it a very useful thing? Yeah, I just didn't feel like there was much of a distinction. It's just all evolution, whether it happened that's over right. billions of years or in a lab over a couple of months. It just seems like it's all the same thing. That's right. And there's some people who say everything is micro. Uh, but there's many people, and I'm among those, who say there are some changes that can happen pretty fast. And we now, this, now know this due to evolutionary development or Evo Devo, where you just switch a gene off and on, you get a fairly big jump. And that's still evolution. And it's it's not that different micro. It's just due to one or two small genetic changes, but it leads to a much bigger change in ex, in the external anatomy of the animal. And that, that would be considered macro by anybody. And the creationists treat that as if it's impossible, but we haven't actually done it in the laboratory. Amanda, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the call. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I have to ask this just because I'm a movie buff. Dr. Prothero, can we make dinosaurs? I mean, you know, come on. Nope. Nope. Uh, sorry about that. Jurassic Park and all the sequels is fiction, and it will always be fiction. Um, The problem is, 
Are you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing, but I'm okay. All right, go okay, ahead. Okay, I know right. you're probably coughing from great shock. I yeah, don't know, whatever. Yeah. But uh, the basic answer is DNA is extremely unstable. It starts to well, it's decaying in your body all the time while you're alive, which means you have all sorts of living mechanisms to repair it. Okay, and as soon as you die, it decays even faster. And even under the best conditions, most of it decays pretty quickly within a few years or a few decades. It's mostly uh, unintelligibly decayed at that point. Uh, we are still, for example, trying to extract usable DNA from a woolly mammoth that was perfectly freeze-dried. Siberia has been done on a number of specimens so far. It's still too decayed to ever really uh, you know, find a way to put the genes of woolly mammoths in a modern elephant and have it born. It's, you know, it's probably looking more and more likely we'll never make it work. And, and the, everything else we know of has decayed even you know, worse. So if you were to take, let's say, the dinosaur genes from a gut of mosquito, number one, that's too old, that's over 66 million years ago, so they would already have decayed, um, and you would not be able to get enough of a sequence out of them. Uh, so even if you tried to do that, put some of that DNA into a chicken DNA, which is a bird, which is close to relative, there's too much that's missing to ever recover a dinosaur. And, and then, of course, being in the gut of a mosquito, it's probably dead just anyway, because the mosquito itself doesn't have any original DNA in its body. It's just a carbon film. So this is something, again, Crichton knew this was all fiction when he wrote it, but he was just pushing the limits of what was known to get a good story. And fortunately, people don't understand it. Hollywood is fiction. It's not documentary. So when you watch Jurassic Park, are you looking at the raptors asking where the feathers are and, and those types? I mean, are you well, looking at yeah, it that, like a scientist or what? That's right. Yeah. I mean, that is something because when it first came out, we didn't know. For sure, the dinosaurs had feathered. The first really good specimen to be found that demonstrated that was not published until 1996. I was there the year it was published, and it was first uh, given at the meetings. And so, yes, the first Jurassic Park movie was pretty good by its, its standards of its time because we didn't know that most dinosaurs had feathers then. And then it was based on what Crichton had written about six years earlier. So it was fine for the late 80s, early 90s, but by 96... And especially about the year 2000, we realized all dinosaurs had feathers. And now we know pterodactyls had feathers, too. That's been proven as well just last year. So um, anything that doesn't show that is outdated. Well, the movies don't care, right? They got it right pretty well in the first try around, although there's some things they did wrong. Of course, like the actual velociraptor is the size of a turkey, and they made Dilophosaurus, the spitting dinosaur, way too small, when it could have been even scarier if they actually had the real size. But those are other issues. The basic issue is that they didn't really care about fixing things. So once they had this you know, naked dinosaur morphology in people's heads, and then they learned by the time of the second Jurassic Park movie that they needed to put feathers on it, they refused to do it. And they, the, the story was they decided it wasn't scary enough if it didn't have the naked reptilian look to it. So they've been told over and over again, and paleontologists still cringe at the topic, but, you know, we, you know, we can't make them change. You know, there's a Christian apologist who calls himself Dr. Dino. I'm sure you've heard of him. Mm-hmm. But I know Ken Owen. Yeah. You know, you're my Dr. Dino. Like, you are the, a dinosaur guy, and you've always been that way. Isn't that right? Well, I do just a fair amount of staying up with what dinosaur paleontology is about. I haven't yet published anything in dinosaurs in the peer-reviewed literature, but my latest book is about dinosaurs, so I've done a job of trying to stay up with it because I am a trained verb of paleontology. You've always had that interest, though. Even you, you said whenever right. you were a kid, you were a young child right. playing with dinosaurs, right. and it just sort of that never left, right? That's actually fairly common among my, my peers in vertebrate paleontology. Many of us were kids who got hooked on dinosaurs at a young age and never changed our minds. But when I got hooked on dinosaurs, that was the late 50s, and it was nothing like today. There was almost nothing you could buy in the market. There were hardly any toy kits and very few in the way of books or posters available. It was just something people didn't you know, find that interesting. I was the only kid I knew in my entire K-12 education who liked dinosaurs. Uh, it, it's a very much more recent thing that every kid seems to go through a dinosaur phase now. Do you think that, uh, I mean, getting back to the film... And just the overall idea of what science can and cannot do. Do you think it would be a moral or immoral thing to try to resurrect a dinosaur? I mean, did they were selected for extinction is the argument. Do you want to speak to that? Well, yeah, the, that's on. Well, the first argument's wrong because they weren't, and the movie says, selected for extinction. They went extinct because of extremely weird events that happened at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, which did include an asteroid impact, but also included huge volcanic eruptions in what's now India and Pakistan. Both of those factors are now known to have been part of it. Either way, they were supremely well adapted to the world they lived in, and then something that they were not, no thing would ever be able to anticipate happened. So they were not failures like lots of people claim they were. They just got bad luck. 
Uh, otherwise, they would still be around here, and we would still be little rat-sized things, and you and I wouldn't be talking. Uh, <laughs> just a bad day, bad day in the Lake Cretaceous made all the difference. Uh, so that part, of course, is is false. Um, they're very supremely well adapted. And let's see, what was the last part of the argument? Now I've forgotten. Well, about, do you um, think it would be moral or immoral to try to resurrect oh, them? Moral, if, immoral. Yeah. Okay. So that question has been raised, uh, not so much in the context of dinosaurs, because we know we cannot clone them by the context of cloning some ice age animals like the woolly mammoth. And the other argument is, if we've managed to make this happen and made some, say, woolly mammoth genes into a modern elephant mother and get her to raise it, uh, what would you do? And then some people say, well, where would you put it is the first question, you know, because once you have more than a few of them, they occupy a lot of space, and it's a big issue of well, where do you put them. And people thought about you know, rewilding nature and allowing ice age animals to be regenerated and then put in places that are not really well settled, like up in the Arctic, which is not too different from what they were living in when they died. Uh, that's been discussed, uh, but it, I think that's getting ahead of the game because I don't expect at any time we'll ever be able to recover good enough DNA to get anything back. Uh, I know you've been very generous with your time. A couple more questions, if you would. Sure. Um, are we evolving right now? I mean, you and I, during this conversation, have we evolved? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Is there a human yeah. 2.0 or 3.0 in our future? What's your take? Right. Well, that's something a lot of people misunderstand, thanks to because of the way science fiction has misled them, because science fiction authors don't do it right. We're not evolving to be some sort of super, you know, humanoid with giant brains and, and uh, all these other features de- extremely developed. Uh, what we do is we evolve on a scale most of the time is not visible. It's on the molecular scale. So, for example, most human populations on the planet now are capable of digesting lactose after they stop uh, drinking milk as a baby because we have so many cultures now which use animal milk to sustain us all our lives. So lactose intolerance is disappearing from the human population, except in cultures that aren't exposed to animal milk. Uh, that we've evolved to change that gene. Uh, there are many other genes in our bodies which are gradually changing, uh, and we're starting to see changes there, but it's not something people would notice externally. They're all subtle things that give us uh, small advantages in, in terms of our digestion or some other thing like that. That's how we evolve. The thing that's surprising is when we now uh, look at the way science fiction authors got it wrong, what isn't changing very much is our brain size. If you look at human skulls, the brain size of humans has pretty much been the same size for the last 200,000 years, uh, or maybe possibly as far back as 300,000 years, when we see the first skull of what we call modern humans. And yes, we are technologically way smarter than a human from 200,000 years ago, but it's with the same volume of brain capacity. So that has not changed. Just because you can do more than an ancient human can do doesn't mean you need bigger brains to do it. And it's ironic, too, because, in fact, Neanderthals, which didn't survive, have, on average, bigger brains than we do, and yet they didn't survive. So the brain size is not tightly connected to how successful you are or how intelligent you are. And that was some, a common myth back in the 1900s was, you know, the brilliant people would have larger brain volumes. It turned out to be not true. Uh, for, for well, the biggest thing it, it predicts brain volume is body size. So if your body size is smaller, your brain is proportional to that. So women, on average, for example, have slightly smaller brains than men, on average, do because they are, on average, smaller body size. But there's no difference in intelligence, although it's been attempts to prove that. Uh, it's all about you know, ratios of how, how big is your brain to your body. So that isn't evolving, and there's no reason to think it would change very much, even though we are getting much more complex thoughts than we would have had 300,000 years ago. Uh, it's all in subtle things. I mean, the, for example, here's where humans are evolving. Uh, many humans now never erupt their wisdom teeth, okay? Because your wisdom teeth, and the reason they're so often a problem is that the, your face has shortened over the last uh, several hundred thousand years so much, there's not a room for them to do anymore. When they come in during your late teens, that's why they're called wisdom teeth, they're supposed to come in when you're gaining wisdom, uh, they are, they're crowded, and as you know, most people end up, if they erupt at all, they don't come in right, they're impacted, they have to be removed, and a whole set, a set of humans now no longer ever develop them. So I would predict humans in the future will have the same brain size, but none of them have wisdom teeth. That's the difference. Okay. Well, I mean, I'd take that evolution. <laughs> I would take that. Um, yeah. No, no. It's all the stuff. It's very subtle is what I'm pointing out. Uh, can we talk about the Science Magazine article? It talks about this skull that was dated to like four million years ago. Um, it's actually a known hominid species, Australopithecus anamensis, and it was known for a long time, but just from partial jaws and teeth and a bunch of uh, limb bones. 
and a few other bones as well. And so they did not have a complete skull for it, and it was one of the few where which we don't have a fairly complete skull yet. So this was the breakthrough in it, and it represents an important species. We already knew that this is this fossil from other things, but we didn't have enough of a skull to say much about what its head looked like, and now that has finally been found. Now, how does it relate to you and I, though? Is it, a, is it an early human, or is it a yes. common ancestor? Yes. Well, the Stralopithecines are the major group of human lineage that is, 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 were roughly descent ancestors to ourselves. And the earliest ones, like Anamensis there, for example, or Afarensis, are the only ones around at their time. And so they're the dominant humans of the earliest part of our evolution. But there, you know, Lucy, for example, is Australopithecus Afarensis, which is slightly uh, younger. And they're, they're you know, very different from what we look like now, right? Lucy, for example, going from nearly complete skeleton now, is, you know, about three feet tall. And yet it was fully bipedal. All, all hominids all the way back to six million years ago were walking on two legs early on. But they had very small brains, the size of chimpanzees, because their body size is about the same. And uh, they didn't have a lot of the other features we associate with being human yet, although they did have really flat faces without the long jaws that, that apes do. So, uh, and the brain capacity was still small, as I said. I always push your book, Evolution, What the Fossils Say, Why It Matters, which is the title of a speech we recorded in Dallas years ago, and I try to get that information out there. But if there was someone who needed Evolution 101, just a nice introduction, especially if they're in conversation with intelligent design folks, creationists, yeah. et cetera, is there a resource of yours where you'd start them, a book, website, what? Well, uh, the UC Berkeley uh, Museum has a very nice evolution website that's very straightforward. Uh, and relatively brief. It has a series of pages with just one concept at a time and a nice short introduction to it. Uh, if you do searches that are sort of triggered by looking for evidence for evolution or some search stream like that, you will get legitimate sites that are not creationist sites that would tell you what you need to know in a very, very short frame. Well, if I, uh, if I, mean, I can I, interrupt, though, very quickly, I've noticed when I go in and I'm doing any kind of uh, Google search, if I type in evolution, I notice a lot yeah. of intelligent design websites are at the top of That's that right. list. And they have evolution yep. in the title, like evolution news, etc., cetera, yep. right? Yep, that's it. It's uh, you had to be careful. Uh, the prompts like that, of course, are they generate hits by how often those sites are viewed, and by far, creationist and intelligent design websites get far more traffic than scientific websites so, because scientists generally don't look on the web for answers. <laughs> they actually go to the original sources. They read books. They read articles. They don't look on the web because they know the web is full of crap. Uh, but the lay public, of course, especially because the, most people interested in the question of that all would be great people exposed to creationism in their churches. That's the only place they know to look. And so I was saying why the Berkeley site is good. It's one of the few good sites out there that does a pretty good, clear job of answering the common things you see in nice, simple form with a you know, one, one question per page type of thing. And so you do, you can get around that. There, there's a, there's other sites that debate, uh, debunk all the creationist arguments and, and, uh, you know, uh, talkorigins.org uh, does that uh, so you can look up if you're willing to get past all the uh, garbage from the creation of sites you can look up just about any of these things and find a good answer but you have to really be careful what the source is Dr. Donald Prothero, you're a good man. I'll make sure and include that link as well to the Berkeley site and Talk Origins in the description box okay, as well as uh, sending yeah, everybody I, I to, to your books So, yeah I have some new ones coming out so pay it to well, the, rec- the newest one out is the one on dinosaurs which it's a fun book that doesn't talk about evolution much at all, but it talks about how dinosaurs were found and how we thought about them and what they we now know about them compared to what we started to know about them. So it's been quite popular. It's called The Story of Dinosaurs and 25 uh, Discoveries is the title. It's out from Columbia News to Press. And then next year should be a whole bunch of new ones. I did a book I mentioned earlier called Weird Earth. It's all about crackpot ideas about the Earth. That should be out late next year. And I'm right now, as you called, I'm uh, doing final edits on my next book in this book, a series of 25 this and 25 that. I did first I wrote the story of life and 25 uh, fossils, then the story of earth and 25 rocks, and the new one, the story of dinosaurs and 25 discoveries. This fourth one is called the story of evolution and 25 discoveries. And so it's going to be sort of like my original evolution book, but it's going to be focused on 25 specific lines of evidence that support evolution and it's given a lot of background on how that evidence was thought about and what it tells us. So it has some overlap with my existing book, but it's got a lot of new stuff you won't run into anywhere else. Good information, good science, and his dinosaurs actually have feathers. And that's just good to know. <laughs> yeah, well, the illustrations are as contemporary as I can get them. So, All right. Dr. Donald Prothero, you've been very generous with your time, and I'll shoot everybody to your website. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Seth. Good to talk to you. 
Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.